Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Get Out of Rat. Today I'm joined by Phil Jordan and Phil is the Head of Contact Channel Automation and Self-Service at HomeServe. And I've just found out that Phil's sister, Naomi Jordan, uh, has appeared with Martin Pemberton on the podcast. So it's, I think this is, this is definitely a first where um, somebody's sister has been on. So Phil, thanks very much for coming on. No, no worries at all. Thank you. I'm glad to thank you very much for inviting me as well. So um, it's good. No problem. So where did it all start for you? How you you're at home serve now, and we're going to talk about the exciting things that you guys have been doing there with um, Sabio. But what where did it all start for you? It's um yeah, it's 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 a it's a good question. Actually, I get asked that quite often because especially when you're when you're working in the sort of realm of conversational AI, people are like, Oh, how do I how do I get into that? Because it's you know it's really interesting. We sort of we interact with these these bots and stuff on a, on a well if you're like me and you've got google homes all over your house i've got dual speaker at either side of me so i can listen to my music in stereo but um if you've got these like bots all over the place which you're interacting with quite regularly people want to know how you got into it and and it's, it's actually quite a difficult question to answer when it comes to me because they always ask me that question i said well actually i started my career as a as a as basically a chemist in a, in a laboratory um it, it started um after i went i went to university i did uh, forensic science at university um sort of left uni looking for that that first job interested in science lo loved the sort of exploration side of the whole thing like that sort of test and learn and and, and sort of taking data sets and, and trying to create uh, i suppose a theory or or some sort of conclusion off the back of it that's what i enjoyed doing um i started working for a company called eurofins which was a it's, it's a food chemistry laboratory that's based in wolverhampton and I, I was a food biochemist and chromatography analyst there for a, for a number of years. But while I was there, I started doing, um, we, we hired a, a business improvement manager where we started picking up things like Lean and Six Sigma tools. Those sort of like um, standard sort of operational improvement tools that you can use to, to sort of measure problems that occur within your processes and try and improve them using, a, using the standard tool set. Um, and I took a real interest in that because although I was, I was performing these processes, you can be one of those guys, especially when you're, you know, the first job, you're normally on a frontline process, you're sitting there just complaining about everything that's happening, going, oh, this, <laughs> this could be better, couldn't it, if we did it like this and so on. Um, so I started picking this up. I said, I might as well be part of the solution instead of just complaining about stuff all the time. And I started picking up these sort of lean tools and that, that led me to this, this career in, in business improvement. So I, I, was, I was trained in lean and trained in Six Sigma and I... I started doing uh, improvements within laboratory processes, um, you know, with with some pretty good success, actually. I mean, we we're aiming for a sort of next day turnaround, same day, next day turnaround. That's what we're aiming to do, because in the industry, you sort of your customers come in they, and they pay for like a, a sort of same day, next day, five day, 10 day. And the majority of your customers are supermarkets and stuff, especially in the food testing environment. They're all looking for that sort of five, 10 day turnaround time. But it was the, the managing director at the time who was like, well, how do we get it next day every single time? So whether they're paying for it, 10 mm. day, for five, they're paying for it next day, next day, every time. That, that all, that's how to make, how to sort of differentiate yourself within the industry. And that was a lot of what we were doing. Now, some of these these methods, they were like, um, some of them were taking up to four days to complete. Um, you, you start a sample one day, you finish it on the fourth. We managed to get them all. So we were delivering all of our nutritional chemistry processes within that sort of next day turnaround time, which is, it's, you know, some great success there. Yeah, that's mega. I wanted to see if I could sort of flex that business improvement muscle in a different industry. And that's what led me towards home service. So looking at sort of financial services, I've, I've been warned about it, working in financial services, a lot more um, sort of uh, sort of when you get the FCA and, and that sort of regulation involved, um, it, it's, it's a lot less, um, you probably get less, less opportunity to be experimental in the way that, mm. that you, that you want to be um, in a scientific environment. You get the opportunity to just sort of, mess with stuff i think there was a quote actually someone said to me it says the difference between science and screwing around is writing things down i think they said <laughs> but you, you get the opportunity just to i don't know just stick some stuff at a furnace and see how long it takes to ash and all that kind of stuff but in in the in the financial uh services sector you obviously you've got the regulation involved you, you you're dealing with with real life humans not samples at this point so you've got to make sure that that rigor and that that it's, it's really robust in that in that space so um I moved into that space and it was a very different environment where, where you're in a sort of chemistry environment, everything's black and white and repeatable. And you know, that's, if something doesn't work, if a QC fails, it's, it's because you've done something wrong because it's chemistry. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, the laws of the laws of chemistry don't allow you to fail because it's had a bad day kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. It was within a contact center environment where I moved to, it was, um, you know, 
three to 400 different variables sitting in seats doing different things on a daily basis, you know, saying it this way because it's easier for them and, and sort of to build, building this work around within this system because we allow them to and all that kind of stuff. So it was a, it was a lot more complicated environment, but we, we were focusing mainly on this, you know, this main contact center metrics, which was AHT, and I'll make things faster, better and cheaper. Essentially, those are the, those are the three things you're working in a business improvement environment. Um, so I did a lot of that, a lot of sort of scripting changes, a lot of sort of system changes to how to take waste out of those contact center processes and also looking at things like transfers, you know, that big, that big thing that you experience when you call a call center and say, oh, wrong person, I'm going to transfer you to this person. They say, oh, wrong person again, I'm going to transfer you to that person. How do we get people to land in the right place first time? Focusing heavily on those, those sort of menu structures, IVRs that, that we have, that, you know, press one for this, two for that. How do we put the right options there and set the right skills up in the background and so on? Um, and it, it sort of led to like a looking at different types of technology, looking at things like, um, uh, we, we call it intelligent call routing, this, this application we were using, which was, um, how do I use data points within the customer's profile to say, you know, they're in the renewal cycle, ask them if they want to talk about that. And they've got an existing claim within a, within home server already, how to ask them if they want to talk about that kind of thing. And we, we started routing customers and re significantly reduced the amount of waste within those processes. And to the point where, you know, we, we were sort of dealing with edge cases towards the back end of it. Um, and, and sort of the challenge was then set to me to say, can we, can we automate any of this? Can we automate any of our conversations? And, and the sort of main uh, targeted calls was like things like changing bank details, changing address and so on. But you're talking like very small amounts of calls there. So we sort of said, well, why don't we go for the big pot claims? How do, how do I, how do I essentially within home server, our responsibility is to, um, when, when they, the people buy the insurance from us, uh, if they have a gas, plumbing, electrical, um, pest security issue within their house what we have is a fleet of engineers which will go out and fix that problem for you um as a, as a as a result of you having this insurance with us which you know gives customers that peace of mind that um, they can take care of the biggest asset they own which is their house mm. so, um we we wanted to see if actually we could automate that that process because the, the product the customer is paying for is the engineer fixing something can we have this process up front which is how do i first identify who this person is then how do i identify what problem they're experiencing then how do i sort of select the right date and time that works for them to get that engineer turning up to their house on time. Um, and, and it started with a, with a really clunky process, actually. It's sort of like, like almost a menu style process of um, how do I, uh, you know, is it, is it a leak or a blockage? It's a leak. Okay. Is it inside or outside your house? It's inside my house. Is it causing severe damage? Yes or no. And it ended up with like this sort of 15 to 20 question monster that took seven to eight minutes to do so. And then we got introduced to, um, Google dialogue flow. So the, the, the sort of technology that, that I'm now using with a, with a business called Sabio um, is the same thing that powers your Google home devices. If you've got, um, if you have a, if you've got one of those Google home devices, it gives you the ability to um, ask, a, you know, give it a command, which we call an intent um, and it will then perform that task for you. So what we needed to do was actually, could we use this technology to, to identify down to a, a really low level of granularity what problem that customer's experienced that was the biggest challenge think about mm. all the issues you can have in your home like you know leaking toilet sinks uh, even roofs and so on if you've got a, mm. a roofing issue if you've got a you know a security issue locked uh, lock problems and gas issues all the problems that you can have with your boilers and all that stuff so we have to see if we actually use this conversation now at all to to get to that level of granularity where we could almost provide a system code and say yeah, it's that problem. We need to we need to roll this engineer for that for that issue. And we know, we've got this customer's postcode, and we can then take them through this process to do so. So, really, that's how it evolved. Was I, I, I don't consider myself to be almost a tech expert or a conversational AI expert. I'm, I'm almost a, a process expert, a problem solver. That's that's what I've done for um, more than a decade of my career. Is is working in different environments with different people to try and fix processes that are broken um, or, or create processes to to create an opportunity and, and that's where it almost evolved into this which was someone set a challenge in front of me and I thought that sounds that sounds fun and exciting I'll have a crack at that pretty much um, there, there's so much there to it sounds fascinating even just how how it starts with um it's I think it's, it shows a real progressive outlook to go and get someone like you in the first place and like you said from the start there's you go from some finite, if this happens, this is going to happen, to then, as you say, all the vagaries and varieties that we bring as human beings That's right, yeah. through to even just, so you said a, a command is called an intent. Yeah. But then straight away, I was just thinking, surely there's even this 
millions of different variations because I guess the customer, I was just thinking about myself, um, uh, we didn't have any hot water last week. Now, when I'm when I'm calling to talk about that, I, I will phrase it, I'm sure, in a different way to somebody else with the same problem yeah. because I don't really know. All I know is there's no hot water and they I got asked questions and I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, or even what I call things might be called, might be different. Exactly that. So, so we, obviously, that that's where that's where the technology becomes really, really powerful. It's sort of because uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of players doing this at the moment. Things like Amazon are doing it with Alexa. There's IBM with Watson as well. But but Dialogflow is, is the technology we chose. And, and actually, what we found is that it's exceptionally user friendly. So there's got to be two sides of you here. One is um, one that uh, you know understands tech and, and and sort of how the uses of it. how can we use this tech to solve a business problem the other one is is you're not going to be able to use this tech if you don't listen to your customers because essentially that's what we did in the first instance we, we overlaid this tech on it and we said in a few words please say how we can help you today and we just listened we captured everything customers said at that point and and you know to, to begin with we just passed them off to the ivr and that, that sort of thing mm. yeah mm. um but what we were, we were sort of like inundated, like floods and floods of different ways of saying things. So as you said, like, you know, I've got no heating and hot water. Um, simple thing. Some people will come through and say, I've got no heating and hot water. Some will go, my boiler's broken. Some will go, I've woken up and it's really cold. You know, all, the, all those kind of things. Yeah. Kind of things that you can sort of get out of this, which is you've got to try and find a differentiate, which is how do I get from, in a few words, please, how we can help you today, to... A system driven code which says this is for no heating and hot water a broken boiler you need a gas engineer to go and fix that problem and it's, it's it's almost building this conversational structure in the middle which we've had a team of people around this there's a couple of couple of guys that have been helping us build that intent model there's a guy called ross parks and, and, and matt bailey who work within the contact center operation and have worked around these conversations for years and years and years and and it really really helps in fact matt was a was a coach as well so he was one of the coaches on the front line um, within the contact center and he's come in and, and he's taken on this technology um, having never worked in a tech space previously and it, it just sort of is testament to the user friendliness of this thing he's an expert in, in the conversations with our customers who is now building a sort of forward-facing tech solution for the business and it's it's a really it's That's a really great. story as well for for the way that we've we've managed to do this at home serve and it's it's down to you need to understand down to a transactional level what the customer wants to talk about at that right level of granularity and the overall aim then was to make it easier for the customer to get to that point where they could actually have their problem solved to make that kind of journey to that point as smooth as possible yeah that's that's right i mean with every contact center environment you get service um, you know there's a level of service that you can offer you have to make a prediction as to how many phone calls are we going to receive today and how long are they going to take? And then you sort of, you have like a mathematical problem that you've got to solve then is how do I staff my operation? Because, and then all of a sudden it snows and then all of a sudden your call volumes double. And then that's, that's the kind of thing that happens as a result of working in any contact center environment, whether it's, you know, that one where you can be almost externally influenced by weather or, or even day of the week. That's the, we mm. see those sort of peaks and troughs throughout the day as well. We get most of our phone calls between the hours of seven and 11 within home serve because that's when people wake up realize their boiler's not working and, and then call us and, or they wake up and they see a sort of stain mm. on the ceiling where there's a leak and, and they call us again so this is this is where um we, we've used this technology to say how do we take out some of those peaks and how do we how do we create a more consistent demand within our contact centers by either removing the length of time it takes to to have those conversations or entirely removing the conversation altogether um mm we've been trying to sort of augment our agents with the, with the tech as well. So we'll, we'll do what we call an IDMV, which is identification and verification before they get through to that agent. And any context we can pass, we will pass forward. So if we've got Mr. Teasdale coming through today, um, he's just told us that he has um, a block kitchen sink, for example, we will then pop Martin Teasdale's profile to the agent and then we'll whisper in their ear, blocked kitchen sink so they can actually start that conversation with good morning Mr. Teasdale I understand that you have a blocked kitchen sink mm. when would you like the engineer to attend and it, and it means that we actually um, are not only fully automating some of these phone calls um, we're actually partially automating them as well and giving that agent that that sort of jump off they need we're not wasting any of the context we're capturing as well that's that's great because just thinking about it's probably overlooked isn't it that um the customers that are contacting you it's emotive because it's their home and there aren't many things more emotive than that and no. i was just thinking then if that had been the response when i called to sort the um, hot water out 
that would have instantly reassured me. Yeah, that's it. It means that you know we, we've we've understood the problem, and also you don't have to repeat yourself. I think there's nothing more frustrating than than saying everything to a robot, landing with a human being, and then having to start all over again. I think it just shows that actually we're not we're not using our technology effectively, and and really, um, you know, regardless of how much automation we accomplish, if you 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 know speak to some people out there, they're talking about how the contact center will be obsolete with with automation and, and RPA and all these bits of technology that are coming out of the woodwork, but. I don't believe that the, the contact centers will ever be obsolete. I think what we need to do is start to utilize this technology to, to start, like I said, augment these agents with all the context we can give them, prepare them fully for the conversation that's about to happen. They become more exceptions handlers. They become more skilled customer service agents rather than sort of transaction takers. I think that's, that's what mm. we take. So, I mean, those, those simple solutions, like I've got a, I've got a leaking tap and I, I want an engineer within the next four days because it's not that urgent, to be honest with you. It's just dripping a bit kind of thing. Um, th those are the kind of things, if, if we're dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with 100 of those every single day, it becomes a bit of a laborious job. Um, if you can mm. deal with a bit more emotion where customers actually need you, I've got water pouring through my ceiling and I need someone immediately. Th those are the kind of things where we need a human being touched to, to take to take that complexity and deal with a, an emotive case in, a, in an effective way. I love that phraseology as well exception handlers i think that's that that's great because it, it straight away it elevates the role it elevates as you said then the fact that i'm going to have to bring empathy to bear to say we're going to sort this out i imagine it's a tricky time right now we're on it yeah ex exactly so I mean, what, what we're doing with this technology because it sits at the front of every single one of our phone calls and it's there it sort of answers the phone calls, identifies what customers want to talk about and routes them correctly. It'll identify who that customer is in, in every possibility we can. We'll, we'll try and identify who that customer is that's calling. What we're doing then is we're, we're sort of sitting this, this virtual contact center over the top of the physical one. It's sort of filtering out all the calls and, and giving the right things to the right people and, and uh, try, essentially trying to then deal with the customer's transaction there and then if possible as well. So it's, it's doing its it's doing its job uh, on behalf of the contact centre. How long has this been? Did you was it a um, stage by stage sort of deployment? Did you take certain area first, or? That's it, yeah, I think I think people um, people ask me that like how do we get started? One because I've sat in front of a, a number of businesses and, and sort of told this story as to how we've done it. Um, it. It's not something we just said. Yeah, let's go do some conversation. We just sort of went out and did some kind of thing. It it, it became an evolution. Like I said, we, we started with just an IDMV. Um, uh, application first. We call it PopServe, um, and, and what it does is it screen pops who, who's calling to the agent after asking a, a few questions. Then we went into that sort of um, that, that data-driven routing, that intelligent call routing I went to, uh, I spoke about, and then that that menu-driven automation as well. Was it, so it's been an evolution over around four or five years. This has to where we are. When we've been using conversational AI, though, we've been doing that for around two and a half years now. So mm. we decided actually. There's limitations of this this sort of menu structure that we have. We're never going to get to sort of wide scale understanding of what customers want to talk about, what problems they're experiencing um, with the technology we were using, which um, which was like we call it directed dialogue, where you, you sort of ask, is it one of those or one of those, and they have to say one of those things. There's no there's no variation around that that response. Um, to one where we have this sort of open response, where I say you know, what's wrong with your boiler? And they say, it's, it's got, got no heating, got no hot water. I'm seeing a, a font code of this and all that kind of stuff. It, it becomes a much more um, mm. conversational journey. But I think that we started with essentially a, a proof of concept with, with Savio. We, we kicked it off. Um, it, was, it was actually a company called Develop at the time. So um, they, they were working as a, a bit of a boutique development company. And now they've been bought up by Savio. So we, we're now part, they're now part of the same group. Um, what we are, what we started with was a six week proof of concept just to overlay the bot onto a small proportion of our call volume and just ask the question in a few words, please say how we can help you today. And within that six week proof of concept, I was, I was trying that the, the hypothesis we were trying to prove out was, could we use this technology to identify down to a feature and fault code level, which are the codes we need to consume within our system, the problem the customer is experiencing, what engineer is required to fix it. And that's what we did. We just started building a model, um, specifically starting with leaks and blockages, which is the majority of our, of our work that we do within the field. And we just started saying, could, could we actually do this or not? And there, were, there was uh, you know, um, quite a bit of pushback within the business. It's quite, it's quite an undertaking for the business to mm. accept. And HomeServe um, were brilliant in terms of accepting this because I, I essentially sat in front of them and said, 
there's this piece of tech, right, which is going to automate loads and loads of calls, and all I need is is a bit of money and your permission to do so. And and obviously, like I said, a regulated environment. There's there's lots of compliance to think about. There's lots of, of, of customer base to think about. We have a very elderly demographic to begin with, and and there's a lot of questions around. You know, do our customers actually want to speak to a robot, and, and are they comfortable doing so? With, with the FCA as well, you've got the vulnerability to think about as well. We, we, we have a lot of vulnerable customers, especially with the, the demographic we have. Um, we've got to make sure that when you're, when you're in a robotic environment, especially when you're dealing with problems in the home, you're taking vulnerability into account. How do I, how do I make sure I can identify vulnerability or, or create uh, guardrails or exceptions handling that I can make sure that they always reach a human being if they need to speak to someone? Um, so it was a it was a it was a brave undertaking from home service perspective, and it, and you know it it's come off very very successful. Now now with the application that we've built with it, it's called Hanna. So we, we've named it Hanna, which is Home Serves Automated Natural Assistant. That nice. Was, that was built by the team. Um, <laughs> we sort of had a competition internally between the team. Oh, did you? Yeah, we, we, we tried to come up with the funniest acronym, basically, is what normally happens when you when you have one of those things. But we landed on, on Home Serves Automated Natural Assistant. Um, and it, um, but, but Hanna's now taking 22% of all of our, our claims calls, our, our new claims calls. Um, she, she's raising 25% of our boiler services as well. Um, uh, that overlaid with our digital channel, which is doing around 11 to 12% of our claims as well. We're actually fully automating about 33% of all of our claims contacts um, between digital and this conversational AI bot. Um, at the moment, conversational AI is doing a, a, bit, a, a bit better because we have the advantage of sort of, we, we've been trying to, push customers, we've got a pretty mature digital channel actually, but we're trying to push customers towards the digital channel. But with that demographic, we're struggling to do so. Like like most, mm. most businesses you probably speak to around, around digital transformation, it's, you know, we, we can build this amazing functionality within the digital space, which, you know, I, I own as the product owner of that as well. But how do you get customers to use it? You've got to, you've got to almost push them there. But when a phone number's out there, because we're, you know, we consider ourselves to be there in the, in the case of an emergency, the first thing customers do is they pick up the phone, dial it and, and, and call us. Um, so it's almost sticking that that butterfly net over the contact center to say, if there's things that we can deal with, let's deal with it in a in a in an AI space. That that sort of digital overlay to a phone call to see if we can self serve here. If not, if customers want to go digital, we'll make sure the functionality is there for them to use. If they decide to call us, we'll make sure the functionality is there for use. If they can't use that, they end up with an agent, uh, and that's where that's where we sort of the hierarchy goes. We want to make sure that digital first try and capture them with conversational AI second and then agent there if there's any exceptions that either of those channels can't handle. Um, and that's what we try to build. From your um, hypothesis, was there was there anything that sticks out in your mind as something that surprised you? Uh, yeah, I think I think we, we, we definitely think as a, as a business in trades, we've always talked about plumbers, gas engineers, drainage engineers, pest people, all that kind of stuff. But what we ended up finding was we had to completely change the language. We sort of we started with when I, when I first drew the, the, the design, I sort of said, all right, here's all our plumbing stuff and here's all our, our drainage stuff and here's all our gas stuff is what we said. But when when customers come through, obviously, you don't you don't call up a company like HomeServe and, and they say, you know, how can I help you? And you go. I need a drainage engineer. <laughs> it's not what you say. You, you say, I've got a block toilet. And then we have to decide, you know, we, we then have to decipher from that language how to get you the right engineer. It's not your responsibility to tell us what engineer you need. It's your responsibility to tell us a problem. It's our responsibility to tell you what engineer you need. And that's where the sort of shift came from. Um, you know, we like our our products bundled in this way, which yeah. is drainage, gas, electrics, when actually that's not how customers describe things. Um, Additionally, I mean, the one thing that that we started getting out of this was this was this thing that we never spoke about before. This we spoke about sort of full or partial automation using this technology, but it was the insight tools we started to pull out, which was all of a sudden we've got these dashboards which are telling us how many times customers want to change their bank details and and how many times they have a, a broken tap and how many times they've got a you know a wasp nest and all that kind of stuff, which is data that we've we've never had before. Um, it's it's information around the contact center, live data that comes through. I can tell you by day what what problems customers are experiencing and raising claims for because we hear them described within the bot itself but then additionally when when we start to then go into date selection and so on and um, where we're offering um dates to customers we offer the earliest appointment slot i'll play your call in a second um when that starts to happen we start to then see actually what are our date offers look like and what are then customers accepting when we offer the earliest date are they you know if we offer something in three days time do they accept it yes or no and we can start to pull on this amazing amount of, of data if it can be organized in the right way it can give you a real insight into your contact centers and business and that's kind of 
I, I wouldn't have expected that knowing that we were talking about um, conversational AI, that there's underneath this, it's just churning out all of this data that at some point then is going to, again, enhance your processes, right? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, because we, we, we've already started doing that. So we started splitting things up. So where, you know, you tend to have um, in most contact centers, you tend to have maybe five or six different departments. We've got sort of new claims, existing claims. We've got a deployment center. We've got sales, retention, customer service. Those are the kind of people like within any contact center, they sort of bundle up into these big, big pots of customers. Now, you know, within customer service, for example. So I think that was the first thing um, that said to me, which, you know, how, how do we automate our customer service calls? And you say, Fine, customer service is this big pot of calls over here, but it's actually 25 different transactions within it. It's not, it's not just one thing. No one says, I, I have a customer service query. They say, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I want to change my bank details. I want to change my address. I want to, uh, you know, the, the policy holders died, all, all those kind of things mm. that start to come out. But then where you have those, those um, different transactions now, not skills or, or contact center departments, you can then start to say, well, actually, we've got a bereavement skill now that sits within mm. that, you know, where a customer mm. says that, that someone's died or passed away. We can now categorize that. We can put a priority on it. We can deliver it to a specialist agent where a customer says I've got an emergency or, or a, you know, an urgent leak or it's causing severe damage. We can now categorize that, put it into its own emergency part and pass it to an agent who's specialist to deal with that as well. And it means that we can be more um, prescriptive about where these calls are going and, and try and use it to, to drive a better operational outcome for our, for our customers as well. Please tell me you've got, I just had Im images then, if you've got this giant wall, a white whiteboard, then it's like one of those kind of FBI, <laughs> you've just you've just gone further and further and further across it all with all these, every time that you deploy somewhere else and you find out all of this stuff, it just keeps going and going and going. That's pretty much it. So we, I, I, could, I could show you the map, actually, I could, that we've got in it. And, and my, you know, the business analyst, she, she, she works for me on, on this. She's my change manager now. So actually, she's the product owner. She's now taken on the product ownership of Hannah. Um, Bav, she's been keeping this map and it's been sort of like the painting of the golden bridge for her kind of thing. So we start and, and we find, oh, this, this conversation is happening, create an intent for it. And she's desperately trying to keep up with Ross and Matt who are just building these intents and building these categories of calls. But we've got this, this massive map now, which has 250 different intents in it, you know, 250 plus different intents in it, which all categorize into a different endpoint somewhere. And, and then we can get the operational stats as to um, for every single one of those, because we've attributed a different call skill to it as well. We can now see actually, you know, how long does a change of address call take? How many, how many transfers do we get off the back of it? What's the wrap time on it? And all that kind of stuff that we can, we can start to break down every transaction at an operational level rather than a skill at an operational level. It gives you this amazing level of granularity that you, that you've never seen before in your contact center. And do you ever sort of step back and think, look at this this is or do you or do you have to stay focused on the current thing because otherwise it would blow your mind well i think this is this is where almost the i think this is where i've been quite quite good at this job is the history of business improvement says so you deal with the biggest opportunities first and you focus i think it's the one thing that that you can often get you you, you can be blindsided by because obviously all of a sudden mm. all these different opportunities start pouring out the woodwork and you've got to be very very specific about where you target because you can quickly and get, disciplined i guess mm. Yeah, that's it. We, we, we stay laser focused on FNOL where, where it came to. So first notification loss within the claims. So that new claims is what we came to. Um, how do we how do we get the engineer to the house uh, in the in the you know, shortest period of time possible? You know, and, and at the moment we are doing it in less than two minutes. So that the conversation that you're now having with Hannah is taking less than two minutes to roll that van all the way through. Um, we focused heavily on that. I wanted to see because it's 33 percent of our total call volume by far the biggest pot of repeatable calls because you can go after, like I said, your customer service transactions, but I've got to build, now build 12 different journeys to mm -hmm. get something which is not even close to the size of ethanol because essentially with, with an ethanol process, you, you're you looking for, um, I'm not going to call it simple because it's not, because the, the but you're looking for repeatable, repeatable mm -hmm. transactions. How do I get it? So because with an ethanol call, there's, there's sort of stages to it, which are always the same. Um, I need to know, who this person is. I need to know what problem they're experiencing. I need to know what date and time they want. I need a contact telephone number. And then I have enough information to load that into a system and roll a van. If you can break down all of your processes into that sort of level of simplicity, which is where um, sort of working in a, in a process engineering and business improvement environment for so, for so long, you strip all the waste out of it. I mean, we say lots and lots of stuff with our agents um, on the front line with, with an ethanol call, but we do that because 
it's a very different interaction. They're not they're not there for a robotic interaction. They're there for a human mm. interaction. Yeah. So we need to offer a human interaction in the contact center. When you're there for and they're content with a robotic interaction, let's offer them one, which is just give me the information you need. I'll give you the information uh, you need, and then we'll we'll get the van to your house. And, and a lot of people are very happy with that. We get a we get a good um, it's a ransom rave score that we see. So we get a, a pretty good ransom rave score. It's it's an eight point five out of nine is what we see overall, because customers who are that's great. Who successfully use it are happy with that because it's yeah. done the job they came for. Um, where, where it falls out, obviously, it then falls with an agent. There's obviously a bit more complexity that the, the agent has to deal with. So um, really, like I said, stay focused on, on what it is you're trying to achieve, which is why I wrote that hypothesis. Like I said, chemist to the end, why I wrote that hypothesis at the very start of this, which was here's what we're trying to achieve, guys. And as long as everyone knows that, um, it becomes really simple um, to try and get to it. Did you find anything... You mentioned the demographics earlier and having having to be um, mindful and careful around around that demographics and the vulnerability that's inherent in there. Um, how, how did how has that played out? It, it's interesting because okay, so we we've tried to I set out some some principles of the team when I first started this, and one of the principles was that we want to make this so anyone can use it, and and really it, it's a case of. If, if you say the word digital or AI, or anything like that, people say, oh, well, you know, elderly people won't be able to use that. And it's like, yeah, but I'm not asking them to code it. I'm asking them to use it. <laughs> it's, a case of, it's, it's a case of you can offer, it's a back and forth. And I, 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 if I play you a call, I can, I can give you an example of what this thing says. Yeah. So it just, um, what we're trying to do is almost raise a claim for a customer before they realize they're doing so. Because we're just asking one question at a time asking requesting a simple response back and if we can do that then anyone really should be able to use this tech so i'll, so I'll give you an idea of what this thing sounds like we can get you to the right place in a couple of words please say how we can help you today uh, toilet system needs repairing thank you please bear with us whilst we check your policy details this may take a few seconds. Great, I have found your details. I just need to make sure we have the most up-to-date address details for your policy. The postcode we have for you is CV22. Is this correct? Yes. Now let's get an engineer booked. The earliest we can be with you is today before 1 p.m. Shall I book that in for you? Yes, please. Thanks. Can the engineer contact you on the number you are calling from today? Yes. Okay, please wait while I book that in for you. While I do so, in a few words, tell us about your experience of booking an appointment with us today. I would say it's first class, better than I expected to be called on it. Thank you very much. Thanks for your feedback. The appointment for your toilet flush is booked today before 1 p.m. The engineer may arrive at any time during the time slot and they will call you when they are on the way to your property. Please can you ensure that there is adequate parking and provide any permits if this is required. Thank you for calling home, sir. Would you like to discuss anything else with us today? No, that is fine. Thank you very much, Sugar. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. That, that was great. Yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's the claims interaction in a nutshell. With with you know a, a gentleman who was you know of of an elderly demographic. I think it's fair to say, he um he came through with a toilet flush problem. He described the issue. We managed to identify off of the initial statement what the problem was. And there's loads and loads happening in the background of this thing. And this is probably yeah. where the biggest challenge came with this, which was you know I mean you. Uh, you know when you worked in contact centers previously we've all sat there and watched an agent sit there with a buffering screen while they're making conversation about the weather and all that kind of stuff is with this environment you don't get that opportunity to fill a blank mm. with something mm. because because of system latency i think system latency has been the biggest challenge we had which was if i've got to return information in two seconds two seconds of silence feels like a lifetime when there's nothing visual in front of you to deal with there's no there's no sort of that. I mean, that's why the buffering screen was invented to let you know that the computer was doing something and nothing's gone wrong, kind of thing. 
Um, this is um, what we've got is, is we then have to dip into that customer's record and we can do so with a phone number. So that if we can identify a single customer record off that phone number, we'll play, you know, good morning, Mr. Teasdale, the postcode we have used, is, is that correct? And that's, that's all happening in the background. We, the next stage, because I mean, this didn't sound like this when we first, when we first went live with it, we sort of like flinching to begin with it, like the, the couple of customers that went through it and then we turned it off, made some improvements, turned it back on again. It's like, yeah, it's a bit better, but we could do this kind of, um, when, when we did this, but we, th that, that date selection part, where we said the earliest we can be with you is, is this date and time. I think it's been um, one long continuous problem solving task to get this journey right. This very short two minute journey it is something that we just have to keep iterating against because we started asking initially, when would you like the engineer to come? And we ended up in a bit of a back and forth with customers because they'd either say today, tomorrow, or as soon as possible. And then so if we didn't have a today appointment, for example, so we don't have today, but we have this date and this date, and they say, oh, this date, or that one doesn't work, and you do this date. And it ends up being a really complicated language model. But we said, if actually, if 80% of customers are saying today, tomorrow, or as soon as possible, let's tell them the earliest we can be with them, mm. <laughs> actually. Uh, you know, we got we got really good success off the back of that. We Our throughput rate went from here to here, like immediately, because customers were just going, yeah, that's fine, and then carrying, carrying on with the journey. Um, again, uh, when we get the phone number, instead of asking them to enter the phone number, if we can see what you're calling on, is that, the, is that an okay phone number to use? I don't know about you, but I've only got one. It's my mobile. I definitely don't give my house phone away. Yeah. So um, if we can see the phone number you're calling on, let's just use that and plug it into the system because we can we can draw that out. Um, and then afterwards, we just ask for a bit of feedback. And that's a, that's a deliberate bit of feedback we're asking for because we needed some way to fill this space of time where we load oh, okay. back into the system, which can take anywhere between sort of four and eight seconds to do so. Um, we, we saw a load of customers timing out. So we said, well, what can we, what can we fill that, that gap with? And all sorts of suggestions like hold music and this, that, and the other. I said, that's, that sounds terrible. We're not doing that. We're not playing hold music to customers um, during this journey. Um, let's ask them what they thought um, and mm. then collect that verbatim feedback. And we see so some really, really good feedback because we can then capture the verbatim back. But I think the, the one the one I've, I've got written down in front of me is, is someone actually said probably the easiest and least annoying automatic booking service I've used. Which it's like, I've Do you know what? I, th <laughs> I, I think you, there's so many good points there. It's first one really being we we assume that de like you say the demographic and i love you say that we're not asking people to code no. where that they they're quite happy because it's about getting something done with the minimum amount of fuss yeah and that that's just that's just brilliant and absolutely you definitely chose the right thing to fill the gap otherwise you could have was one of the suggestions did you see the football last night well actually you know that we've we found out that there is a small talk api that you can plug into google so you can make small talk if you want to i don't, I don't, know, I don't know where you'd use it personally <laughs> yeah. we also found an api where you can tell tell a random chuck norris joke at that point as well so you can you, you can do all sorts of things i mean there's so much it's open source information you can you can plug in whatever apis you want to it so it, it's it's the beauty of this tech is it could be good fun, like doing this exploration, understanding why customers are dropping out is the biggest part. You've got this funnel, right? That, that all these calls come into the top, then some of them will, will or will not select a problem. Some of them will or will not be identified. Some of them will or will not select a, an appointment or will be eligible to go through. And your job, essentially, for the rest of time now, you've built this, this living, breathing virtual agent that's there doing the most work out of all the other agents in the contact center. And it's just customers falling out left, right and centre for, for one reason or another. Your, your job is to identify why and go and think of a, a creative solution of fixing that problem. And it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a difficult job. I mean, people, mm. are, people are looking at you when you're working in this space because it's, it becomes a, it's a big investment up front, and, but it starts to deliver back significant amounts of value to the contact centre. And it just, it just sits there and, and does it every day. And it doesn't, doesn't you know, call in sick and it doesn't have shift times and all that kind of stuff. It does it at two in the morning and it will do it at seven in the morning as well. And that's, that's the kind of thing that, that it, it's sort of like this continuous value, but you need that team sort of continually supporting it, continually improving it because it stops becoming about how do I do this one thing? And all of a sudden another 20% of customers start going through it's how do I do these thousand things? And I get 2.5% mm. of an improvement every time I change one of those things. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really, really interesting job, especially if you've got a sort of scientific mind, if you, if you like sort of tinkering and messing around with things, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good place to be. And, and, and luckily the team that I've been working with, we've got, you know, a few third party developers from Sabio and, and they're based all over the world. We've got, um, a guy called Vitaly, who's, who's still in Ukraine at the moment. So 
he's had a bit of turmoil over the last uh, couple of couple of years, to say the least. He's been absolutely mm. brilliant though, for what we've been doing. There's a guy called Alvaro who was in Bolivia. He's now in Spain, um, but he was working with us on this as well. A guy called Christian, who's, who's the other developer. He's been um, he, he's been all over the place. He, he's been in Cyprus, Northern Ireland, everything. So he because because of this remote working environment, we don't ever physically meet each other. <laughs> we just sort of, we've been working together for the last two years in a completely remote environment, but. Um, the way it's been working um, with, with some offshore testers as well, we've got Canimala and, and Vanita who live, who live in India, and we've got some people living all over the UK and everything as well. But it, the way the team has come together, we've just found ourselves in this environment where um, everyone just likes doing this stuff because it's interesting and it's you get to you get to change something regularly and you get to see the improvement of that change and it gives you that little sort of dopamine kick every time you see a KPI. I bet. That's, it, that's what it is. I bet because it's transformational stuff. I mean, it's um, it's it's brilliant to to hear. You, and you must get this question a lot. Then, what what's next? Where what's the or what's the current thing you're working on? And then what's next? So we're currently working on a couple of um, additional sort of like uh, voice automation use cases, especially around existing claims. That's where it becomes really complicated. Where a customer already has a claim book. So they've come through and they want to discuss an existing claim. And, and, and really, there's only a few things they want to do within that environment. They want to cancel it, they want to reschedule it, or they want to chase their engineer or find out where they are. So we're looking around actually what transactions can we do in that space. We're already providing them with an engineer status update where we deflect some calls. We basically say, the engineer is going to be with you between this time and this time. Um, they'll call you when they're on the way. Is there anything else? And they can say no and drop out. Or they can say yes and go to an agent at that point. Um, um, but the, the next part for me is there's a couple of things that I... I'm really interested in doing is, is let's put this online let's get some sort of chat bot online and see what we can do in that space it, you know it, it's a it's a very different environment people go to the website for different reasons that they are more transactional on the website than they are mm. in a con, in a contact center you tend not to go to a website because you've got a problem you tend to go to a website because you've got something you want to fulfill with the product that you've got um within addition to that is i want to see what we can do with the agent desktop so we're now capturing all this information. We're pulling loads and loads of data out of this, out of the agent, out of these customer profiles, and sort of how do I now provide the agent with an absolute snapshot of everything that they need to know about this customer before they start having that conversation? So, um, Mr. Teasdale, for example, he is calling and he's on his second visit with an engineer. He's already got an open complaint, and the engineer is five minutes before the the cutoff of the end of the end of the appointment slot. How do I provide you with that information and give you a jump off to say, here's what you need to say to this customer right now, and, and really augment those agents with the context mm. that we can pull out of our systems and provide them with, say, this is the scenario, open this call in a very different way you would if they're, if they're calling to um, raise a new claim, for example. And I think that's that's what I'd like to start having a look, see what we can do um, in that space to be really creative about how, how do I help my agents now? And that, um having once been an agent for a few years that's going to have a big impact on on um employee well-being because i used to liken it to sometimes you would just open you, you you're thrown through a door yeah and as soon as you've got through the door people are shouting at you and you have no idea why or what's yeah. happening and you just yeah, they're, shouting at, they're shouting at the person in front of them not not the thing they're angry at really i think that's that's the I mean that that's the issue with customer service. I mean, I mean, my my only experience of working in a sort of customer facing customer service environment was a bar, um, and and that was always good fun. Um, yeah, everything. Yeah. But it's, uh, you needed yeah. Hannah in there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, that's it. You know, have a robotic barman. Uh, no, I wouldn't dare do that. It's, um, yeah. they'll, they'll probably serve everyone else first, wouldn't they? Everything. So, but you end up. Um, yeah, but exactly to that, you, you want to be able to arm your agents with the information mm. that they need to handle that call because, it's as you said, it's not fair for them to be blindsided by this problem that, that they have no awareness or context of. And they the next thing they have to do is while the customer is, is bawling at them about this problem that's taking place is trying desperately to find their record to understand what's going on and, and what's what's happened to get to this point. Um, how do I how do I give them that information when it arrives? Because you know we, we can pull whatever it's our systems. We can pull whatever information we want out of it. It's just how do you then turn what is essentially a data exercise into something that's now customer facing and useful? Um, that's that's the challenge with with any of these programs. Is there anything? I mean, you you're making a great success of this. It's actually it's brilliant to hear it. Is there anything um, you would have done differently that would have saved you either time or that you look back and go, oh, we could have done this. Um, I, th I think it's, 
I think I think having a look at our systems in the background, I think the one thing we, we could have been better prepared for things like latency and so on. We were sort of one of those things where we, we landed things and then realized we had latency problems when actually if, if, if you go back and think about it, you, you know, we have latency problems because, like I said, you, you sit, you do a side by side with an agent, for example, and you see them sort of asking them what they're doing on the weekend while this sort of thing's loading in the back. Then you don't put two and two together while you're, while you're having those, while you're doing that really, because I was sort of looking at it saying, oh, we could save a bit of time there by doing this, helping improve that system so it doesn't buffer for so long and so on. But um, yeah, I think, I think having a better awareness of our systems and, and, and our architecture in that sense would have been a good start. But really, um, I, I sort of, within a, a sort of scientific environment you've got to live with no regrets haven't you everything's progressed mm. so yeah you always start knowing nothing um, and we didn't know anything we had an idea of of almost how we were going to approach this thing and um i think to say we had done it differently we probably would have oh, i probably would have gone for this technology significantly sooner before we go for it because uh, it would have given us more time to run off but um really i, I think like i said it's progression you, you you learn a lot along the way um and and would I change anything? Probably not, because I wouldn't have learned those lessons if I had. So it's a, it's a case of it, it's a it's a difficult one to try and answer that. I think. Um, well, when you've been out in our um, industry, do people of people kind of been saying to you, "Would it work in our industry? Would it work in retail? Would it work in this? Would it work in that?" Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, absolutely, they do. And actually, the, the biggest question I get asked is about vulnerability. It's the one one thing I get asked almost every single person I speak to um, is. is Vulnerability. How do you deal with vulnerability in a robotic environment? And also um, sort of operational resilience as well as a big part of it. If I'm doing 33% of our, of our call volume, if, if all of a sudden Hannah decides to, you know, um, to, to go down at that point, all of a sudden 33% call volume starts flooding back into the contact center again, we end up in a, in a scenario where, where resilience becomes a problem. But um, I think with any, any robotic process, if you have a, a repeatable transaction and you have, an agent sitting there essentially fulfilling that transaction you're asking yourself the question how do i how do i remove that conversation how do i replace that agent conversation with a human conversation anywhere where there's some uh like i said emotion required or, or sort of any any sort of human context that needs to be put on this it's not going to work but actually the majority depending on on which industry you work in if you're working in retail you're probably going to be asked about order chases and so on yeah so if you're working in a in a, in a food environment you're going to be asked about products so do you do you have this in stock and so on all of that is something that a customer is going to go what's the product it's one of these type it into the system yeah it's it's at your local branch and if if an agent can do that by sort of typing in information into a system and then reading information back out of a system then yeah of course it can that's what that's what hannah's designed to do or, or google dialogue flow is designed to do and you mentioned something earlier that i guess i bet is another question you get asked a lot is in your in your opinion, then knowing what you know and seeing what's happened and what you've been able to do, when you look at our industry and contact centres of the future, what what does that environment look like to you? What I'd expect to see, uh, well, I think my, my environment, <laughs> what, what I'd expect to see is a much smaller, like I said, exception centre. I'd expect the majority of these processes to be happening in mm. in a in a digital environment, in a in a sort of system environment with then really only the things that, that require a human being that require that human touch like i said emotion or, or, or some sort of problem solving that is probably beyond the realms of, of the current technology stack that we have um to be falling out to an agent i mean we, we've got all sorts of solutions it's, it's finding the right mix of you know rpas and ais and and, and sort of conversational ais and to to lump it together to say how do i deal with 80 to 90 percent of the problems so only the 10 percent are falling through it, it's a case of uh, that that's what i'd see happening a much smaller contact center within a much bigger sort of technical team sitting in the background this is what what i expect to see at the moment we're sort of making that transition we've just started this year doing it's essentially an operational handover with this this started as a tech program that you know i had to go out for you know capex funding for and say you know just give me this and, and, and i'll go build this this tech project and now all of a sudden we're looking at it going wow it's, this is consuming you know one and a half million pounds of operational workload within our contact center it's handling phone calls in the same way an agent handles a phone call so it is actually part of our contact center now and we've just gone through this big process of of, of sort of change of ownership, which is I'm going to keep building some new cool stuff, but really this belongs to the operation because it's part of it. And it's filtering all the calls, it's handling everything before it reaches your agents. It should belong to you, and you should have the the you know the onus on on its on its resilience and and then the way it works and so on. Um, that that's 
that's sort of the first step towards how do we combine these two things into how, how does tech become a more significant part of, of that operation? I think if you go into in any other environment, I don't know if you've ever been to like a, a car manufacturing plant or anything like that. Tech is is everything. It's you're surrounded. Mm. There are people. Mm. If, if you go to I did, I did a walk around Jaguar Land Rover. And um, if you, you walk around the front, the first half of it is, is sticking bodies together, putting shells together and so on before um, where, where you have this repeatable process. The same car is going through every single time, has the same sort of subframe, has the same body shell on it and everything like that. So it's all rivet, rivet machines, all rivet robots. They're just putting things together. The second it starts to become bespoke, the second we start to have, you know, this customer wants this trim on their seats, this customer wants this steering wheel, this customer wants this stereo system. in, for example, that's where the humans then step in and start handling those exceptions. That's what I'd start to, accept, to expect to see is a lot of upfront robotics within a back end of human human uh, interaction. And it all start to sway. Like I said, we're, we're getting to that point where we're taking significant proportions, but we're nowhere near 50% yet. Um, we'll get there, though, uh, eventually. It's just, mm-hmm. like I said, there's probably 20,000 problems to solve before we get there. It's exciting, though. I think in all of the things that you've shared, just to kind of, the numbers that you're talking about and the impact it it's had, I, I imagine lots of people listening will be very excited about the possibilities that we have in kind of, and as you said, hand that handover to operations mm-hmm. um, is a is a significant thing. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. And I think um, you know, it, I've had I've had a conversation with a couple of our, our contact center operations teams, and you know, they're asking me to say, I, I want to learn more about this because. You know, if you've still got 25 years left on your career, for example, mm. depending on how, how quickly we move forward with this with this technology, which you know I'm going to say is going to be quick because there is this arms race between our conversational AI developers, between Google, Amazon, IBM, you know, all those nuanced, all, all those sort of conversational AI teams that are out there working. They're all trying to get this better and better. They're all trying to, everyone's seen that. That's an arms race we can get behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. I mean, everyone's seen that, that sort of Google duplex uh, example of that, that, you know, booking that hair appointment and, and so on. I mean, that that's a, it, it's very much an R&D project that, that Google had taken on. But there's there's really, I mean, if, if it can be done once, it can be done again, um, mm. and it can be done at scale. So, this is, this is where these kind of techs start. So, you know, getting, if, you, if you're working in a contact center environment, just getting a, your head around sort of AI and getting your head around how it can be used to, to replace that, that sort of, you know, like I said, moving out the realms of robotics where mm-hmm. that's designed to replace physical activity to all of a sudden this, this realm of AI, which is there to replace human cognitive activity as well. And when it, it's all of a sudden starting to replace entire humans and, if you can get um, you, you know your head around that and, and start to understand how this technology can be used in the environment, you can start to learn more about it and, and start to take you know head down that field if you wanted to. And I think anyone that's listening to this can can hear the passion and how much you're energized by by it, and, and why not get involved and find out more to to make a real difference ultimately to customers as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I think, I think we're, we're all, I don't, I don't know about you, but we're all very time scarce. I've got three kids. My wife works, she's a teacher. So not only does she work all day, but she works all night as well. Um, and, and and obviously I've got my full-time career on top of this. It's, we're all very time scarce. Um, I am looking for a quick digital solution to solve my problem. Like no one, um, under no circumstance will I pick up the phone and call Amazon. Um, I, will, <laughs> I will jump on the app and I'll do it while I'm sort of making tea and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That, that's what you do. And, and if you have the capability of doing it, me, I, I'll do that because we none of us have time to um, mm. to, have, to take that time out to, you know, phone a contact and to sit on hold, see if they can solve that problem for you. If they can't, you know, I've got to go and find an alternative for this. It's, it's, a, it's a big chunk of the day that, that it gets taken out. I'm, I'm looking mm. for simple, easy transactions that I can just, be done with and, and walk away from aren't we all yeah aren't we all phil <laughs> yeah. this has been absolutely brilliant I, I i've learned so much and um it's great to hear uh what you've done thanks so much for for coming on i imagine you're going to get people contacting you and asking for <laughs> advice and where to start and what to do so um I mean, I- <laughs> People will tell me, especially at home, say that I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get Hannah involved. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'll just I'll put an automated system on my phone and I'll give you all the advice back there. No, it's uh... <laughs> but uh, honest, honestly, Phil, it's been great. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for coming on. No, thank you. Yeah, it's been really good.